welcome to episode 13 of Slay House Review. I'm gonna like back up into the frame because like I don't want to be like so much bigger than you because now my body dysmorphia I mean, is being look at how oh, yeah. tiny oh, and God, I'm small. So small. <laughs> Perspective really is a wild thing. I think it's because I'm just actually so yeah, tiny. Yeah, because you're actually so cute. so and even when I'm right next to you, you look so much so more tiny. tiny than big, massive also, like, fat angled. fuck me. Yeah. No, you look great, Bastia. Well, yeah. whatever, girl. Now, every time I go back and I watch these videos, and I'm like, wow, I look fucking fat, girl. And I know. I, I like look I'm, weird. Because it's a weird angle for both of us, yeah, actually. Like, I feel like every time I, like, post one of these, I, like, look at myself, and I'm like, okay, now I'm pissed because the vlogs that I face that are front-facing to the camera, like, I look a certain way. And I'm like, okay, right. now everybody who, who is subscribed to me knows that I'm actually, like, fat real life but except they're not yeah though, you know because i'm body in real dis- life looking at you body dysmorphia down body dysmorphia down. one point okay. for body dysmorphia so, we are this week's story vincent's party by tessa hadley ran vincent's party <sighs> wait let me try to do a deborah treesman impression i don't even think i can do it but i don't know um, if she sounds like this week we will be this week um this week, Tessa Hadley will be reading her story, Vincent's Party, which ran in the July uh-huh. 1st yeah. issue of The New Yorker. The July 1st edition of The New Yorker. Here's... No. Uh, yes. Tessa Hadley has won various prizes and has published 30 stories in The yes. New Yorker. Yes. Here's Tessa Hadley. That's pretty good, actually. Now, why don't you try? Okay. Um, this week on The New Yorker. Tessa Hadley reads Vincent's Party from her upcoming collection. (laughs) This will be in the print edition of The New Yorker on July 1st, 2024. Now, here's Hadley. Her forthcoming novel, The Party, (laughs) will be published by Penguin Random House. (laughs) And it comes out July 11th, 2024. Look for it. July 11th, 2024. (laughs) Look for the gummy bear album (laughs) in store. Um... One thing I've always been curious about the audio, like the writer's voice podcast, is why the fuck does Deborah Treisman feel so compelled to deliver that opening introduction in such a proper whisper? I mean, I know there is that whole like convention of the NPR voice, like especially back, back, back in the day. You know, there's that famous Mm -hmm. SNL skit, the sweaty balls, where like yeah, the the women are um, sweaty talking like this, but. I feel like people on NPR don't talk that way anymore. Yeah, because it's a little more idiosyncratic these days. Yes. Like, you, it's, know, it's, you know, millennial lifestyle has bled right. into everything, including our public radio. Right. right. Much it's like even, fluoride in our drinking water. Right. You know, <laughs> Public radio is getting podcastified in kind of a way, I would have to say. But then I have to think, is that how Deborah Treisman, like, talks in real life? Do you think she, I um, don't necessarily like the story you are thinking that we should run for the November 12th issue. And I think you should go back into the emails right. and look for stories from perhaps a more distinguished author. Maybe um, Joyce Keller Oates has another story she'd like to Right, write. right. You know, I or mean, do you, you think- I really could see that. If your Same boss thing. talked to you that way, would that make you more upset or would you feel comforted by that? I think I would feel, it's like that sort of like gaslighting level of like, like <laughs> nicety that would ultimately drive you crazy. I feel like it would like, actually work on me and I would feel like petrified to death of like upsetting or letting down Deborah Treisman if I worked under yeah, her. Yeah, she would give you that, you know, I'm not mad, just disappointed yeah, just essentially is really what that is. just disappointed in the quality of work I that really you've, just, um, you know, been showing lately, Marco. I thought that we were beyond that. Are you typically into older women ever? I don't think I've, well, everything actually, always when I was boils like, down to whether or not we'd fuck Deborah Treisman. Well, okay, so I went, when I was in my like early 20s, like a woman in her like late twenties was like very sexy to me, but I don't think it really. Like you never like a mommy beyond... thing. No, no, I'm not like interested I in like it... fifty year old. Because my thing is, is like I understand when gay men have daddy things, but there's something aesthetically repulsive to me when like lesbians have mommy things. Wow, well, is that really just sexist of you? Do you I think? Mean, yeah, I mean, like I think it like is, and I'm not. Girl, stop apologizing. So I'm not going to, thank you, Rachel Hollis, I'm not going to apologize for thinking it's gross when lesbians have mommy things. That's, and even when straight guys have mommy things too, I find it, actually, I find that less egregious. Because I, in in that case, I'm like, yes, mama, in terms of like the older woman, like having sex with a younger man. Like that kind of feels empowering to me on the woman's behalf. And I love a cougar. 
a woman who's got like tanned leathery skin and a bad balayage. Yeah. She's really thin and has kept herself up as she's aging. She's got like two teenagers. Right. But she's having sex with a 22 year old like that feels American to me. And it feels. I think that's maybe what you're picking up. It's sort of a French vibe to be into older women. And I actually like kind of like, like it as a concept, but you know, Today's, I'm just not. The Spotify question for this week will be, would you fuck Deborah Treisman? <laughs> I, I mean, I will say she is like very pretty. pretty. Yeah. Is she, is she? I bet she's really smart. Is she Jew? I have no idea, actually. Maybe. Okay, well, let's read the language of her. Or is she just like, is she like Balkan or Arab? I have no idea. Because I will say, like, if we're doing a whole physiognomy thing, like reading the language of someone's face, to borrow a phrase from Azealia Banks, who recently said that the <laughs> language of Lord's face is dishonest and that she looks like a racist public school teacher, which, like, she does, but, like, I, like, you <gasps> know, I did let's not, not hear about Let's this. not do too much on Lord. I mean, Azealia's right. back on drugs. It's a whole other yeah. thing. But if we read the language of Deborah Treisman's face, like, I actually think she's like, she seems really cool. She, like, she seems, seems like, like, you know, what, if fun. you were at a party and people were like doing shrooms, she would be like down, I you know? I feel like she would be like, she'd, like, like, she'd like, like, come with drinks and she'd be like, oh my God, Margaret, like here, drink Yeah, this. like what are we doing? Yeah, like, like, like let's okay, get like, drunk. What can I get to yeah, you? Know, like an older party mom, but like an arty party yeah, mom. Yeah, she's an arty party mom. Yeah, I, you know, I really do like her vibe, actually. And I think her it's, nose is very sweet and sort of, I think she has like kind of very sweet eyes yeah, as well she, and like a really genuine kind of smile. Eyes. I like her in this photo. I mean, I know she's like gang stalking us and whatever, but. And I will say, okay, she's kind her of fun. face does remind me of a certain 30, 30 something year old woman that both of us know who happens to have red uh -huh, hair, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm, she mm -hmm. is like the good one and the one totally that we know it. is like the evil version well, of I this. Like, like she is like the good version of that person. Like if that person sure, that we yes. know was like right. a little bit cunty, not cunty, but like a little- Serving, like, serving cunty. Not, not, no. not like, um, like actively trying to harm us. <laughs> Not out to get us. Yes, right. Yes, not. So maybe Deborah Treisman isn't out to get us, but she's her gang stalking is her showing yeah. us her solidarity. Yeah, and honestly, her cartoon I've always thought has been very cute with her little earring. Oh, yeah, I love in the, the one, vector art cartoon. Yeah, it's actually really well done. They rendered something about her eyes that's not somehow offensive. Like they gave her little like, like eye little bags, bags that looks cute, and I think that really captured her like beautiful smile. <laughs> yeah, she actually does have like a really nice. Wait, go to this one. You know the thing about her is she's got very Anne Hathaway type. Yeah, of vibes. okay, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah and she looks like, like my like an older cousin, a smart, maybe who... a smart, older, capable woman yeah. who's still sexually viable, but also wise. You're actually talking me into being kind of like sexually. I know, to her. me too, a I little mean, bit. She actually does have very. I mean, that's a lie eyes. on my behalf. I don't think I'll ever feel sexually attracted to a woman. Yeah. One time, one time Lucas like baited me with this because I think he found that I was like jerking off to like straight porn, which whenever I do that, it's solely just because it's I like, find a man having sex yeah. with a woman hot because I'm into straight guys. But I, he was like, I know you're like secretly into girls. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> really not like, I don't like, and again, girl, stop apologizing. Thank you, Rachel Hollis for allowing me to say this. I do find women like sexually, physically repulsed. Like that is the yeah. same way that a straight man would find me physically repulsed. The same, the same way that a gay man might find me physically repulsive because I'm so fat and disgusting and I should kill myself is the same way I feel about women. Wait. Okay, you had me until the last. Oh, sorry, you were. Oh, okay, you were bit. doing doing a bit. Okay, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just an idiot. <laughs> no, I'm just like not funny and kind no, of. No, like, you're really. Bad at I'm answer. sorry, I just wasn't tracking. <laughs> My bad. Yeah, exactly. Um, no, I think you're absolutely perfect. And uh, but I totally get it. I was thinking, can I relate to this? And I was like, well, I don't find anyone on the basis of like gender particularly repulsive, so I can't. Oh yes, you like because you're a bisexual. Yeah, you're a, right. You're but, a like, liberated you know, bisexual find people, woman. Yeah, like repulsive people. I will so. say George Saunders looks exactly how I thought George Saunders would I look. Him. You know what I'll say? I love him. Another thing I'll say about George Saunders, I've never, I don't know what he's written. I've, I've literally never heard of fucking George Saunders until like the last two years of my oh, really? life. And suddenly it's like everyone's oh, saying great. everything about George Saunders. I don't give a fuck. I actually like really like him. What's his word? He, right, I don't know. He just sort of like, he does sort of really voice driven, like... 
Well, if you're Short one of his stories. students, he will blurb your novel for you. So, good, you know, good on you, George Saunders. He's always willing to he's give a blurb. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? Here's a picture of him and Deborah Treisman. Do you think they've had sex? I think they have. Wow. That's kind of, they're kind of. No, actually, I don't think they've had sex. They're kind of giving, like, friends who went to college together or something. Or maybe, like, sort of like maybe they've, like, lightly flirted, but yeah. they. Um, they're on a first name basis, for sure. Yeah, exactly. That's it. I actually don't think they have had sex or have had sexual tension yeah. looking at this photo. Would you concur? And I think it's, like, she wouldn't. He, he would. would. Yes. Yeah. But he wouldn't dare try to make a move. Right. He's just a he knows, respectful guy. Yeah, exactly. And he knows that Deb doesn't rock that way. Look at this one. That's so, she makes she's very. Why? Look at. Look at her kind They must have done like eyes. a talk or something. Yeah. The writer, well, she looks oh, a little. she's his editor, I think. I think she's his editor. Okay. Brain blast. We should write fan fiction. Yeah, the writer. Or oh, maybe it's. Yeah. Or maybe it's a discussion they were having as author talks about being a writer and going through the editing process and famous editor talks oh, about being an editor. Oh, that's actually and probably through. exactly what it is. Yeah, that's absolutely what But it is. I've got another Anne Hathaway rom-com, fan fiction rom-com idea. And in, yes. this fan, in this fan fiction rom-com, Anne Hathaway is playing the role of Deborah Treisman. And we can get like... Absolutely. I don't know, like fucking like Mark yeah, Maron to play the role as... Right. Or like... Who's mm-hmm. old? I don't know. The uh, fucking the Malcolm in the Middle, bad, bad, bad breaking, breaking bad. Brian Cranston. Yeah, Brian. Yeah. Cr- okay, yeah, actually, yeah. Anne Hathaway, Brian Cranston are starring in the oh my god, Deborah yes. Treisman, George Saunders erotic comedy. I think that's actually brilliant. Who's gonna write it? Who's gonna write it? Who's gonna no write it? No one steal this idea. No well, one listens to this podcast. No so. <laughs> Whatever. So anyways, we're talking about this story, um, Vincent's Party by Tessa Hadley. Yes. And um, you didn't like this, did you? I actually did like it. Oh, okay. I, did, I, was like... I was just sort of brain suited because of the, you know, the move. But I actually like really I was got really, sucked like, into this. I was kind of like talking myself in my head about like having to fight you on this story. I thought it was not your Why? speed. Why? I don't know. I just like for some reason I'm like, picking up the vibe that you like. Well, maybe my intuition is actually like really bad, and I actually don't know anything about anything. I think if you were picking up on anything, it was the fact that like my anxiety has been through the roof since yeah. I got rear-ended. So like, it's <laughs> since I just took it up the ass. Leaky. I mean, like quite literally the vehicular accident, but I actually <laughs> love that. Yeah, since I took it up the ass. Another brain blast idea for a lit hub article. Lit sex. Me. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> to beep that. <laughs> Continue though. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, why anal sex has wait? I, I had it and now I lost it. It's like anal sex um, unlocked my anxiety and <laughs> but made me a better writer. Anal se- my P- my PT- my anal sex related PTSD has crippled me in life but liberated me as a writer. <laughs> Lit Hub front page. Absolutely. Woo! Absolutely. Woo! I think like the sort of like sub line should be like, um, <laughs> oh, it should be something like rear ending more like, yeah, I mean, we can work with that. <laughs> yeah. 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 We'll like ask that. Chat GPT. Yeah, we can ask Chat GPT. Okay. Anyway. I thought this was really good, but I think it's particularly because I like like British <laughs> social fiction. I always call it social fiction and I don't know if that's exactly the like phrase for it you but mean it's about fiction that's personal yes that's primarily concerned with relationships and people standing in like the social caste system in right. whatever environment that they exist in evelyn waugh is the example i always bring up when i want to sound smarter than i am like when i mm-hmm. like try to know what i'm talking about but what i really think about is like you know gossip girl which is the comedic version of this perhaps the low brow quote-unquote version of this sort of thing where it's we don't really care about plot. We care about yeah. characters and relationships and how that dynamic plays out in like the hierarchy of this world. And I love that sort of thing. I and agree. Brits do it well because as you said offhandedly, yep. they're obsessed with class. Right. They're still obsessed with class. All these nasty British people can't get this notion right. out of their they can't get it out of their uh, I don't know. I was gonna go with more anal sex jokes, but like <laughs> No, but that's that's totally true. It's like And so it's like because it's so ingrained in their way of thinking, they do this kind of writing really, really well. Just like how when I was reading Japanese literature, that Japanese book I really liked, 
they do cruelty and also like place in society fiction very well because it's just the way that they think. Yeah, so, well, that's like very interesting. It's sort of like capturing the milieu in some way, the social, like it comes through the like vibes of the social and dynamics. The thing I just like about it, I feel like fiction is really its best when it's like we're given characters, we're being told very quickly who these characters are we're being shown who these characters are and then afterwards we just let them play amongst themselves we get ample dialogue and ample action to read through and then that demonstrates what it is about each character the interplay about each right. character gives us information about the world that they live in and who they are further i like it when we just have a cast of characters and then just let them play and this very much does that absolutely and so so in terms of like plot recap because again not much yes. actually goes on but essentially our cast of characters revolves around a pair of sisters we mm -hmm. have the older sister moira who's an art student in university we have the slightly younger sister evelyn who is studying uh something french, at university. I think, really oh french, french studying yeah. french at university this is um in bristol uh about a few years ago after you know, World unclear War. number of years after World War II. Mm -hmm. And so the sisters are going, Evelyn, the younger sister, sneaks out to join her sister Moira at a party at this sort of, like, location that's an old bombed-out factory or something, like, back from World War II, but they sort of bootlegged it. This guy, Vincent, who we don't actually really spend that much time with, ha is throwing this party, and they're all set up here. Uh, Evelyn arrives, meets up with her sister, and then they start talking to these two men who yeah. show up at the party. They say, oh, you know, we just met Vincent outside. We're here. And they seem kind of posh, right? Yeah. They seem kind They're of like upper class. They got money. And, you know, the rest of the people are like a little bit more like working class, like, you know, not quite bourgeois, like whatever society people. They're just yeah. sort of like more normy kind this of This is very much like a beatnik type of story you know about yeah there's a lot yeah. of talk about like art students because Moira's in art school mm -hmm. and like Vincent is also an art school Vincent is Moira's friend and talking about like wanting to spend time with like the rougher side of society and this like bar in the bombed out factory is where a lot of like sailors and prostitutes go to get clients which are like people from the docks because they're by a big like dock there's a big body of water which is also alluded right. to multiple times throughout the story you know people right. you know is sitting on a wall that overlooks a big body of water um, right and so the thing i just you know this was also a great sister story i love I stories so. of just girls being girls, girls. Being girls. and Let's all girl, the, the yeah. peeing oh it's exactly so oh so good at the end yes when yeah. they both pee on the wall right just girls and it's like the thing i love about sister stories when they're good is it's like i love the fact that sister, sisters is such a great relationship because it's number one two girls grappling with like female companionship right but also it's like the family thing and the weird like intimacy of like knowing a lot about your sister but right. not knowing the whole story because it's and like I thought that was really really, well really done. nicely mm -hmm. done especially oh my god what was it talking when so the older sister moira we learn has been sort of in potentially engaged to this man named Cass, who was in the army and sent away to um, some colony yeah in malaya which Malay i assume is malaysia, malaysia. yeah to like, and, police some farm yeah to like, do some sort of colonial duty of yeah some i'm sure there's some like british colonial uprising right. at the time so what ends up happening is like these two men that they meet the the posh guys are sitting with the, the pair of sisters and uh you know evelyn the younger one is like you know isn't well, I I think I always thought my sister was engaged to like Cass, yeah. and the sister says like, "Oh no, we're not. Never actually, we're engaged." Mm -hmm. The other posh guys are like, "Oh, good luck. He's if he's in Malaysia, he's dead." And she's just like, "Oh, like." And so no, what don't we learn about the two posh guys is one of them, the one, the younger one, whose name is Paul, is like really, 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 really rich. He comes from like generational yeah. wealth. His family used to be tobacco yeah drives farmers. a bentley yeah. in the 50s yeah. or whatever and then the other guy we never really he's the older one his name's like snicker or something like it's that sin not sin sin or something, sin something like that um and he doesn't ever go out and tell us what he is but we can tell by the way he's talking about cass's situation and how he's like oh yeah that kid's probably dead on i would like do they ship kids out there Every time I want to do a British accent, I end up doing an Australian accent. And every time I want to do an Australian accent, I always... Yeah, you just got to go. Yeah, exactly. So, like, um, 
speaking of Malaysia, um, Kuala Lumpur is on my list of destinations where me and you could end up being expats. It's like the oh. new upcoming Asian activity hub because it's really cheap and they have like everything because they're right by Singapore and wow. right by Bangkok. Okay. The only thing is I think Malaysia is like, like really Muslim. Hmm. But I, I think Indonesia is the one that's more like conservative. Whatever. Anyways. Oh, and the other thing that is, I think, um, good to mention, even though like she wasn't really a big part of the story, is there's also this like painter's model bohemian girl sort of like sitting at the table with them that Moira knows named Penelope? Josephine. Josephine. And um, she's kind of getting into a banter with the two rich guys because I think she's like super hot because she is like a super hot girl. And she won't take any of it. She's yeah, like, exactly. she won't take their shit. She's like, whatever, I'm leaving. Like, Yeah, yeah. And they like call her a communist. Oh, I've never seen a red in real life before. Yeah, they're and she's like, like she's and then she's like, like yeah, we'll take you to fucking look, boys. And right. she like just poses and for them, which leaves. I thought was kind of tea. Yeah. I think another thing about this piece that was really good is this really does, you know, even though this is set historically after mm-hmm. World War II, this really does capture like what it's like to have a club night yeah, when you're like sort like of random there. Yeah, yeah, there's randoms there. You're you're sort of floating around you have to like talk to people that you may be like don't really okay like. how do yeah, i exit like, this situation so like getting towards you're the going end of outside the story, you're like right, going outside buzz, but not buzzing going up. back inside yeah. whatever so the two sisters the older sister is like hey come with me first they have to they have to pee and these men are like we want to drive you home and they're yeah, like yeah. no no we're gonna take the bus so th- then the older sister's like okay let's go look upstairs for a bathroom oh, but before that she so Evelyn goes outside with Josephine and Josephine just like totters off into the night because she's sick of it. Yeah. And then while she's outside, this guy from her French class. Yeah, from her French class comes out and he's like, Oi, blimey, uh, I'm glad it's I don't I actually don't remember what he said, but she had invited him to try and like prove to this guy that she was like and prove to herself as well that she was like this sociable like creature right. who like had this exciting life and was like a real bohemian girl you know that she had a really hop in life and she didn't think he was actually gonna come because he's like a big old dweeb but he did end up coming and um yeah yeah and then they talk and then there's like a whole thing about how like she likes him but he's a little like weird looking and because there's this also dynamic between the two sisters where like moira like is very like astute in her judgments of people mm-hmm. and like her sister like really kind of respects and takes for bible her judgments of people when she brought up this guy was in brandon i have no idea yeah wait the, um, the french yeah class guy bernard I well know. moira said he's an npa not physically attractive which i thought was come to donald donald yeah yes yeah, then, yeah, 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 yeah. Not not physically attractive and PA. That was good. But he's drunk and she's just a little bit drunk and they're kind of going back and forth outside the bar and she's just like, ugh, like I really wish I was like a cool girl. That's the other thing that I found really kind of like, you know, um, that found resonance with me about this story was like, Evelyn, you know, Evelyn, she's not a cool girl, but she wants to be so bad. Yeah, and you know. and She's aspiring and she's trying. Right. Because right. her sister's one. Her and, sister's an effort, effortless cool girl. Right. The part that I, like, enjoyed the most is when they do go upstairs looking for a bathroom because they oh, w- don't want to go home with those two guys. Mm-hmm. And so they're up there, like, just, they go up a few floors because it's, like, somehow yeah, this building like, has, like, several floors. And I also thought this was well done as well. Like, the just the setting and world building of this nasty, like, crawl up the stairs in mm-hmm. the dark there's no lights the light switch doesn't work they have to use matches to find their way up because they're looking for somewhere to pee right and of course they don't have you know like a flashlight cell phone because it's you know the 50s yeah. or whatever which is like oh that's so they literally so have like, matches yeah so they're like up going up there looking cannot find a bathroom anywhere so finally like the older sister of Moira was just like I'm just gonna like pee right here, and they're gross, in one of the rooms gross, way upstairs, just the end of the wall. And, the, and Evelyn's like, "Oh my god, it's gonna, it's gonna smell." Oh my god, ah! And she's like, "Well, it smells like shit in here anyway." So then they both start peeing, and then while they're peeing, this is so so yeah. true. When you're drunk, girls going to the bathroom somewhere you shouldn't be, the truth comes out. Like <laughs> you know, just like mm-hmm. so. Moira's like pissing, and she's like, "By the way, Cass is dead. Like my fiance, he died." Like several weeks back yeah, and she, like, he is dead and she like tells evelyn this when her pants are still down yeah, while evelyn's, evelyn's like mid like, pants like, uh, yeah. and evelyn's okay. like oh oh my god like, like, oh my god pussy geez. out in this nasty like, mm. building 
Yeah, well, it is what it is when I'm in love with the trumpet player of the band. Yes, and then and then Evelyn's like, oh, no, it all makes sense to me. Well, mm-hmm. we're told this in third-person narration. By the way, this story's done in third person. And a pretty close third on Evelyn. And a yes. pretty, I would say, well done close yeah, third. Yeah, I thought it was really, really good. Yeah, and um, she, Evelyn's like, oh, my God, this now makes so much sense. Because throughout, in the like initial parts mm-hmm. of this story, the narration was making it seemed like Evelyn thought Myra was like actually really into these two guys, or at least the more attractive one, and like seducing right, him. Right, right. She sort flirting of with him. needs her yeah. sister's flirtation. And now flirtation. after that, oh, because Moira says like, oh yeah, I'm into the trumpet player because she revealed that Cass went to Malaya or whatever like Mal- the colony Malaya was at right. the time. Um, because she had said that she wasn't going to go to Paris with him. And then right. after he died, his mom thought it was like her or implied fault. it was like her fault and she's like well yeah maybe it like is because i because I, I didn't love him enough yeah, to go with him to my paris heart, like oh she was like i told him that i loved another man and then she was like oh, well what other man and evelyn was like and she's like the trumpet player and then with that information evelyn is like oh okay yeah All you didn't actually sense. like those guys who were just trying to make him jealous yeah you were course, flirting with these two guys because you had eyes on the guy and the band mm-hmm. and you know what if, if that isn't so relatable and i don't know so what like is. true to like moira being this cool girl and knowing mm-hmm. how to navigate and these she's things. like you know i'm just making him a little jealous because he the trumpet player still got a girlfriend and, uh, yeah, I mean, another thing it's i found like, really quaint and cute about this story was like the way that evelyn like talks about jazz music like oh yeah this totally would be like what a cringe like kind of like aspiring cool girl yeah, in the fifties who like right. wants to be a beatnik would like say about jazz. Like, like they, don't they need to, to take it. this serious. Like yeah, this music comes it's so from like deep, like the sort of you know like fetishization of like you know American black people and like their cultural offerings. Like that's absolutely the way like a British girl who wants to be cool in the fifties would think about jazz music. Um, and then wait, what else? What else was I? Oh, going and to at say? the end. So at the end, in order to avoid these men, instead of walking down the stairs after they've pissed upstairs in a random room, they decide that Moira's like, we're taking the fire escape out. And it's all rickety, and it looks like it's going to fall apart. And so, like, the younger sister is nervous. Evelyn's like, oh, I'm like, I don't know, my sister's always been wild, all this stuff. And, like, you really are led to believe, like, oh, maybe something bad will happen. But... You know what? They make it safely down the fire escape, mm-hmm. and that's that. I really, yeah, I really liked how. And then once Evelyn, so Myra just like moses her way down, and then jumps. It's like a six mm-hmm. foot jump down to the ground from the end of the fire escape, and then like Evelyn takes a little bit longer, and then she's at the end about to jump and sort of like taking in the scene and pondering her own mortality and how Cass mm-hmm. is dead. And then before she jumps, she asks. Moira like, are you it's really sad about Cass? And Moira's like, shut up, just jump. Like, yeah, who come cares? on, let's go. And then she just jumps. I yeah. loved it. I was great. So girls being girls. It's girls, girls, being, girls. being girl fiction. Yeah. Which great. And you know what? It's like, again, I'll just reiterate. I think fiction is its best when you just are very briefly at the beginning of a story. All the character, the cast of characters is laid out for you mm-hmm. right there, and then afterwards you just let them play amongst each other yeah, they're in just space, living in exactly. this, in this just, world. Yeah, I agree. The, and I left this story feeling very satisfied because I feel like I knew these people, I knew this scene, and yes. I enjoyed going along with the ride and learning more and seeing how they operated. Seeing how I they loved interacted, it. yeah, interacted. I loved the sort of like the tenderness between sisters. It was like not to, it doesn't hit you over the head. There's no plot points that felt like overly contrived. There's exactly. Sort of just like exists a night in someone's life at a party. It's natural. 60. 70 years 70 ago. years ago. Which, you know, is like in and of itself enough justification for a story, you know? Absolutely slay. Yeah, absolutely slay. I actually slay. really enjoyed this. Um, I absolutely... I, it's funny that you thought I didn't like it, but I think I was just dissociated. <laughs> yeah, I think so. so too. I think I'm just, like, always nervous about everything, so I just, like, assumed the worst. No, I mean, same. Yeah. I mean, I absolutely... I'm still going to save, like, a 5 out of 5 for something that, like, really knocks my pants yeah. off. I'm, I'm giving this a 4 out of 5, and I might yeah. dare to say... Actually, I don't think I would say this is my favorite of the ones we've read so far. I still think that away by the old the hot yes, old guy yes that one was I actually really maybe good. i'd put them on even footing 
Like, yeah, I think yeah. I would too. I, I think I also give this four out of five. I mean, I give the one last week. I also really liked as well, four out of five. Um, but yeah, I actually. I don't even remember what last. Oh, Roddy Doyle. Yeah. Yeah, the buggy. I I thought that was good. I I really I really liked this, and I liked their relationship, the sisters, and it reads well too. There was exactly. no and part of it that I was the like. Other thing. I always up. find it so shocking when I open up most books, and no matter the time period, it's always not active scene it's always monologue and i always find it so shocking whenever i'm workshopping something and when i say this i really don't mean to toot my own horn as if i'm like some brilliant no, writer but horn. what i'm saying That's is fine. like people are always people always point out like wow your stories are so like dialogue heavy i love the way that you do dialogue you put so much dialogue in yeah. your stories and i'm like yes because that's what makes fiction readable is scene active scene and mm -hmm. that's a big reason why this story works so much better and why that way works so much better than most of the stuff we've written right because we're getting people doing things in action dialogue scene and that's how we're learning about the characters we're learning along with the story we're following along it's engaging it's not just like big fucking bricks of monologue i hate that I hate big bricks of third limited third person monologuing. And for some reason that's the MFA standard for American fiction. So I yeah, Absolutely. you better spill that tea, mama. You better spill that tea about American literature, mama. Yeah, you better drag those authors, mama. I think you better spill that tea, mama. You really better Absolutely. You better let old Tessa Moshfeg have it, girl. Is that how a Tessa writes? Because I actually no, most of her stuff's in first person. You would actually really like incredible. it. Incredible, I know. I actually um, all I, these I, years I, I have not I don't I mean, I don't mind everything that you just said that you disliked. Yeah. Um, I would say, but it has to be done well because I think it can easily get very boring. But I think when it's done, yeah. when it's done very well, I actually like like the good like a, a good rhythm if the prose is strong enough to create the movement that is also achieved through something and like the dialogue. dialogue has to be if it's so, like a novel. Like you have to be like saying yeah. shit that's like provocative, funny, not yeah. just like so earnest and insightful. Like, come on, if we're going to be doing this, if you're going to be dragging me through a paragraph with no action, no scene, you're going to be making me chuckle a little bit or like really oh, go totally. like, there's, oh, there's wow. Be like, you, know? Purpose, you know, something there. Like yeah. beautiful words and beautiful like world building means means as much to me as like the diarrhea shit in the toilet that I, you know, Woo! may or may not. Yeah. Well, you're going to smell that tea, mama. You're going to drag them groin. You're going to be slay i was really concerned in episode 13 when marco took on an exaggerated <laughs> black scent <laughs> i wanted to give this podcast five stars but i have to take a star because in episode 13 i was really concerned with marco taking on an exaggerated black scent to mock <laughs> someone who may be encouraging him and his opinions i just think it's insensitive given the way that the publishing industry often suppresses voices of people of color and communities of color which is actively untrue i really feel like we are in an era of publishing where it is advantageous of you to be from a marginalized community you might feel like tea girl <laughs> but the thing is is but i don't have necessarily any problem with that i really don't I, right girl stop apologizing you know <laughs> rachel hollis wants to empower me to be as racist as i want to be but what I mean is that I really don't care. I mean, all I care about is whether or not I can get published. And this right. makes it a little bit harder for me to get published. But luckily, I am also gay. I mean, that's true. And poor. That's also true. So it's not like I'm necessarily completely out of the You're not out, out of, of the, the game. Yeah, You're absolutely so. not out of the game. Yeah. yeah, I do. I do. And I'm a bottom, too. Also a great yeah. point. To go back to and our theme. I'm transgendered. <laughs> Could you imagine this? I like come out to you and say that I'm transitioning. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. I really don't mean to like <laughs> continuously go on these like comedian against cancel culture type of rants. But at this point in the running of this podcast, it feels almost necessary for me to do like this half-hearted. It's just so easy to riff off of. I don't find necessarily this like funny or believe a lot of the things that I say. It's just a bit. It's a character. To our two listeners, I just who hey probably already abundantly understand. It's that. already abundantly clear. I'm just always <laughs> scared and paranoid that like someone's gonna. <laughs> Girl, you and me both. You wanna, yeah, you know exactly. You know, but it's fine. And, you know, I think all things considered, at least this was very successful. Yeah, I think so, too. I think this was a su I successful. I think she did a really, and it was perhaps, I would say, maybe the longest story 
in terms of, but I, I don't know. Was it? Um, we, I can't think of anything that was, I mean, the Polish one, I feel like was around this length. What was that about? I'm literally like, it was so remember. bad. It was like a little kid, like a little gay boy and like his dad. Oh, actually, yeah, now yeah, that yeah, I say like yeah. it was so bad, I actually don't feel like it was that bad, but I don't think I would, maybe I would bump oh, that no, one up. Oh, no, he was the sensitive boy. Yeah. I, that one was actually, like. And, and remember at the end of it, we're like, we don't necessarily like this as a short story, but as a novel excerpt, we would rate yes, this novel. Yes, that is because the pacing of that. So I don't know if that actually was longer or if it felt just longer. longer i will say this read very quickly which again is another asset to fiction which is mostly dialogue and scene is that it reads so quick right which no, is how i all agree i agree be. because it's all it pretty much all takes place in like the the sort of present the literary like the yes. present moment which i you know i find what i my personal taste is the right way to be a writer and to write literature and anything i don't like i is, think that's actually is true. the wrong way that's actually true though thank I you mean, so much you should just, we should. Girl, stop apologizing. <laughs> <sighs> okay, anything else in literary news that you want to necessarily talk about? Anything that you're reading? I'm not reading anything at the moment. Well, you just it's finished like, Lolita. Just finished Lolita, yeah, which was really interesting. Well, really good. Um, you could say Lolita was really good. It was good. It was good. I was, I, it was great, actually. I really enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was interesting what i was interested by was like why people really hate it so much because it's clear to me that they didn't read past the first three pages because at the beginning of it it says there's a fake forward that like is part of the story about why like this is like a criminal who is crazy and that is you know it's perhaps like, one of like a great just like revelation and realization about a lot of things is like you can't necessarily get too angry at people who have dumb opinions because most of the time it really is just people talking out of their yeah, ass they like like don't i know what they're I'm, talking about like i i could almost be like let's say 90 percent positive that anybody who thinks like lolita is this like damaging like awful novel and like has set culture back like just didn't read it or like right. doesn't understand right. that like right a thing is separate from or the cultural thing or get this this is what blows my fucking mind the same like people who are like oh lolita you know purports or you know it, it somehow endorses like child sexual abuse are the same people who are like obsessed with like um true crime and it's like okay exactly. how do you square that circle because this is it's the same it's like, supposedly what, has what the is same so much better anyway. about your like john benet ramsey like Right, conspiracy obsession, theories, which yeah. is a real person, and that really happens to versus a no. fictional character that has an ideological, and it's the point is the opposite of what you're saying. And even you know if the mean? point wasn't the opposite of what, well, it's also fake yeah, though. Exactly. It's also no. not real. Whereas yeah, exactly. like true crime whereas, is like, real, and being obsessed like, and feeling like and I understand that kind of true crime impulse where it feels yeah. like because you care deeply about a case, it makes you like on the right side of history you're because you're like you're moral. somehow pursuing justice and like right. the like it's like no but the, you're just the honor of like t yeah exactly of like the, the honor of like getting a victim's story told and like exp holding um people who are commit atrocities accountable but like no you don't give a fuck about that because like, most like, of the victims like, families don't want you to be mucking around yeah, in their personal lives absolutely. like go read a book go read go read a book yeah lolita. go read lolita and right. then you know fantasize about that and in spoiler your alert way. it's yeah. not a spoiler since it literally starts off the first four sentences um he gets caught yeah. he says um you know of course i'm a murderer i have a fancy prose style within the first paragraph and also like, it's like and at the end like lolita right. does become like kind of a, like a destitute like prostitute who's damaged by it right at the end like when yeah, she grows she's up not like um outwardly like a prostitute per but she's se, just like but a lost girl a money, nowhere girl. and she's married to this guy and they have a baby on the way and she's they've got no not no money so she reaches out to humbert humbert and says can you like send us money yeah, and, you know, and so then he like come obviously like comes to and it's not like her. yeah so it's not like she like reaches out to him and is like thank god you fucked me when i was 10 years old exactly. because my it's life not... is so perfect now and i right. love getting fucked by your old man cock right I, i'm so happy that you pedophilically abused me like right that's not the, that's like, not what happens god. Yeah. it's like there's nuance all this to say 
But, and all this to say also, like, I feel like this is well-trodden territory. And even though it is, like, no matter how many people make this point, like, people will still be like, oh, you're reading Lolita? Like, hmm. Right. Like, right. I don't think, like, I don't think we should be discussing this at a college level, literature like, course. Mm, Ugh, whatever. Uh, whatever. But then the other thing that just occurred to me that's ironic, I'm also talking about Lolita without actually reading Lolita. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, I mean, you yeah, know, you definitely I am, read it. it was I am definitely throwing stones from glass houses and might I invoke Rachel Hollis one more time? Girl, stop apologizing. I'm not going to apologize for right. speaking ignorantly and I mean, not really know, necessarily knowing what I'm talking about. One of the most. So what? I'm going to do it. Yeah. I'm not apologizing. Don't. Thank you, Rachel Hollis. I mean, okay, we've been going for like 40 minutes. Yeah. Anything else mm -hmm. you would like to say? Um, Anything at all? I got nothing. No, me neither. Um, you know, do what you gotta do. I mean, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you made it to, if, okay, I do wanna do just an experiment. Right. Because I know the people who do listen and comment, you guys always, you do comment. Come I assume always. all of you listen to a big chunk of it, but if you did make it to this point, just include in your comment or edit your comment or do an additional comment and say, yes, I listened to the, through the entire thing, I made it to the end. I'm just personally, personally curious. curious. Not that I care whether or not you listen to the whole thing really truly. I'm just curious. Yeah. All right. Okay. That being said, bye guys. Mwah. Mwah.